the next speaker is uh, Dimitrios Lignos. And um, his presentation is about composite steel concrete buildings. And Dimitrios, so you, you have uh, 35 minutes for the presentation. And uh, so your presentation should ideally uh, stop at noon, uh, considering the delay. And uh, I don't want to go into details uh, regarding the uh, resume of uh, Professor Lignos that you can see here in this slide because we are already on delay. On, on the other end, you were already presented uh, at the beginning of this uh, webinar. So uh, now I stop sharing uh, my presentation. Dimitrios, if you can, please, yes. uh, please, the floor is yours. You can start your presentation. Uh, so thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Uh, I'd like also to start by um, uh, thanking uh, the uh, Earth Engineering um, Association for the invitation and organization of this uh, webinar, as well as the project team uh, two and other people for the extensive amount of work uh, that you see today just in brief. So I will cover the composite steel uh, concrete buildings. Uh, so this uh, chapter uh, contains rules for the design and verification of composite steel uh, concrete buildings in seismic regions. Uh, the general structure of the chapter is uh, comprised of uh, the sections that you see here, plus uh, several annexes. Uh, Professor Landolfo covered, uh, I think in fairly good detail, Annex C on pre-qualified connections, but there are also, there's also Annex G on composite joints, uh, as well as H on column bases and I on uh, design of slabs. Uh, I will uh, mostly focus on the primary novelties. Uh, so in the first three, mostly the same with uh, the current version of the uh, Eurocode uh, 8, chapter 7. So I will uh, basically uh, talk about structural types, uh, behavior factors, as well as uh, some aspects on drift limits. I will also talk about some novelties on the verification to limit states uh, and design rules for dissipative uh, structural behavior of composite systems. Uh, and then I will touch on a few things on composite moment resisting frames, and I will link this uh, with uh, the annexes that uh, we discussed. Um, I will, uh, I'd like to say that the general uh, design rules follow chapter 11 that uh, you show by Professor Landolfo. So um, uh, with regard to uh, structural types and behavior factors, the uh, general structure is uh, fairly uh, similar with uh, structural steel systems, with the exception here that uh, now we have uh, composite moment resisting frames with dissipative uh, partial strength connections that are only uh, allowed in uh, DC2. Uh, but uh, although in DC2, you still have to do a uh, capacity design verification at the uh, composite joint. Uh, moreover, uh, the chapter covers uh, composite structural wall systems uh, with the appropriate behavior factors that uh, we also see here uh, tabulated. Uh, now, moving on to the verification of limit states, there have been additional uh, verifications of the significant damage limit state that you saw also before in other structural systems and materials uh, conditioned uh, on the structural system. And for instance, for moment resisting frames, the interstory drift angle shown here should be less than 2%. And this check uh, is only going to control uh, moment resisting frames above, I would say four stories because in this case, their design is usually drift controlled rather than a strength co control that you typically have, for instance, in wall uh, systems. Uh, similarly, in um, uh, composite frames with concentric and eccentric bracings, uh, the respective limit is uh, one and a half percent. Generally, these systems, though, are strength controlled, as we know from uh, practice, uh, so this limit is not expected to control for, uh, let's say, low to mid to uh, mid rise uh, systems. Finally, uh, for composite wall uh, systems of uh, type one that corresponds to steel moment frames working with uh, concrete infills, yeah. as well as uh, type, as well as type two, as well as type two, uh, which is composite walls reinforced by encased uh, cross sections, and type three. Uh, composite steel beams coupled to RC walls, uh, 
the corresponding limit here is uh, 1.7%. Uh, now, uh, moving along to uh, section 12.8, uh, the design, I will talk about design rules for dissipative uh, behavior in DC2 and DC3. And in particular, I'll focus on local slenderness of cross sections within dissipative zones. And as we know, I think we saw some of the questions also, this should be restricted. So for steel members, uh, you saw by Professor Landolfo that generally uh, section 11.8.3 should be applied. But what's new here is uh, if you are using encased or filled composite members under compression and bending, uh, the new table 12.4 here, uh, which is the condition to uh, uh, the Q factor, uh, you will see that these limits for uh, filled rectangular cross sections and filled circular cross sections have been uh, relaxed compared to the current code. And I'll show you this in the next slide. The new values have been calibrated to uh, test data so that, so that the extent of local buckling is uh, limited along with uh, fracture due to uh, ultra low cycle fatigue that you see here in some of these figures uh, that is generally observed in very slender cross sections after they experience local buckling. So if you want to get an idea here for uh, encased or filled composite members under compression and bending uh, and appreciate the differences with the current standard, uh, the highlighted blue values uh, essentially show the uh, differences in the uh, new limits. And uh, while for partially or fully encased H or I cross sections, the limits are the same, the new limits on filled tubes are generally more relaxed, providing flexibility to the designer to select a rich range of cross sections that are standardized in the respective design for a given uh, Q factor. So this generally is supposed to, uh, to uh, provide, as I said, flexibility, but also uh, potentially lead to a lighter uh, composite construction. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, when it comes to the verif verification of members in DC2 and DC3, as we saw in DC2, the resistance and stability of members uh, defined uh, by structural types should be verified according to the uh, uh, equations here that uh, essentially uh, relate axial, flexural, and shear demands. And uh, you have the omega factor here that generally is uh, linked with chapter 11. Uh, and the inclusion of partial strength connections as well as composite structural wall systems where the member that is primarily verified would mostly be columns. And um, this is very important, especially if you consider that in DC2, there is no capacity design at the joint uh, as it used to be done before in DCM. Uh, the overstrength factors range uh, from, I would say around 1.5 to about two. And uh, these values are consistent based on some system level studies that we've done uh, within working group two, as well as uh, elsewhere. Now, I think uh, uh, something that is quite important relates to verification of composite beams. Uh, as we know, composite beams in dissipative zones may be designed uh, with full or partial shear connectors in accordance to Eurocode 4 and the degree of composite action of at least 80%. So this is the same between the current and the new uh, provisions. However, while in the current version of Eurocode 8, there was an additional penalty of 25% reduction on the shear resistance uh, that was flat regardless of the cross sections that you were using in the new provisions, for composite beams with uh, depths less than uh, or equal to 500 millimeters, which is quite typical in at least European design, the 25% reduction is uh, waived. Uh, so uh, this, the previous provision or the current provision was based on push out tests uh, that you see here, an example where shear connectors were localizing uh, in the mode that you see and crushing of the concrete in front of the stud, as well as localized deformation along with fracture in the weld collar was uh, typical. However, uh, because uh, this type of uh, information, let's say, doesn't consider the ability of a structure to redistribute forces, uh, as well as the framing action that uh, is, uh, is uh, present 
in uh, these types of systems and the ability to redistribute the forces once plastification occurs within the uh, dissipative zones and re-engage more studs uh, during um, the seismic action. Uh, if you actually see uh, CR connectors from actual beams in, uh, in, uh, that, that consider the actual boundary effects and so on, and uh, you look more closely, you see that essentially this mode of deformation that was uh, uh, common in push out tests, it's actually not so common in uh, more realistic boundary conditions. And um, a redistribution after the onset of damage is very beneficial. So this is why the 25% reduction uh, that has been waived uh, for uh, shallow beams. Uh, another aspect that I think is important uh, relates to the uh, ductility requirements in composite steel beams within a dissipative zone in uh, positive bending. So uh, the uh, uh, new table that you see here uh, essentially is under the assumption that uh, concrete, uh, con we consider um, uh, the confinement in uh, uh, concrete at the uh, top of the slab. So generally, the um, uh, confinement, uh, uh, sorry, concrete uh, strain, uh, the strain at crossing is in the order of uh, four to four and a half uh, mil. And uh, this is why the upper limit now that uh, you could uh, use to design uh, composite beams and control crossing uh, is actually much more generous compared to uh, uh, what you had before. And uh, if we look at the uh, current Eurocode, uh, this uh, would be in table uh, 47. You see that the uh, previous provision was based on uh, the assumption that uh, uh, crossing, uh, concrete crossing was not considering confinement. So this was like a two and a half mil at the uh, top of the slab. And this is why the upper limit on the, uh, on the uh, Z over DC ratio was actually much more strict compared to what is uh, proposed now. Now, uh, just to appreciate the, uh, or to get a feeling of what this difference means, I will basically contrast the two codes uh, with just an example, uh, where of a typical uh, composite uh, cross-section here, that I will assume that the uh, steel cross-section uh, would be S355, and the concrete characteristic value of 20 MPa. So with the uh, current uh, version of the code, if we try to design this beam and select the cross section, uh, the table here uh, shows you what would be the allowable cross sections to be picked uh, in white. Uh, when the Q factor increases, uh, depending on the length of your beam that you have here in the second column. And uh, as you see, essentially designs uh, with Q factors larger than two, uh, practically uh, would uh, provide a very, lim a very limited uh, uh, choice of cross sections, practically impossible to use uh, standardized cross sections. Uh, whereas if we uh, look at uh, what's happening now uh, with the new provisions on uh, ductility, you see that uh, for instance, if you pick a Q factor in the range of 3.5 for a DC2, for instance, uh, design, um, the uh, or even 5.5 uh, will have a much wider range of cross sections to be available for the same design, which offers uh, very large flexibility in the design process. Uh, another thing that is uh, also uh, important relates to the slab effective width for uh, plastic bending resistance calculations, because also this affects in DC3 at least uh, strong column uh, weak beam ratio. Uh, to be considered in uh, the design process. So the current code uh, would have, uh, in fact, two tables. I have only the second table here with uh, a considerable number of cases, depending on the sign of the bending moment, as well as the location of the associated column, in particular exterior or uh, interior. Uh, and then uh, the code would have you select what would be the associated uh, effective width. Uh, so in uh, the new version, this section has been greatly simplified. In fact, uh, the table now has been greatly condensed into the much lesser number of cases that you see here. And this is thanks to work uh, 
uh, within uh, working group two, uh, that essentially the sensitivity of uh, the effective width has been uh, uh, evaluated in, uh, by looking at uh, several different designs, as well as uh, additional experimental data. Now, one thing that is a little bit of an open problem still, uh, but I mean, I think, you know, there could be an interesting uh, conclusion here is what should be the right effective width to use. And here uh, I provide some information on benchmarking of the partial effective width for um, an exterior column uh, when the slab is in tension. So here are the contour lines. So the uh, effective width for different uh, drift limits as measured from actual experiments. And uh, what we actually see is that the recommended value in the uh, current standard corresponds to uh, uh, the drift limit that uh, in fact, we're now using for a significant damage uh, uh, limit state, which is of interest when we do capacity design of uh, composite steel moment frames as we discussed in TC3. The value also matches well with actual uh, measurements from composite beams that experience failure, failure as we see here in the uh, example in the transverse section of the composite steel uh, cross section, which actually provides a nice background on what the um, uh, effective width should be for uh, composite systems. Uh, now, moving along uh, with the verification of composite joints in dissipative zones, the integrity of uh, the concrete in compression should be maintained and yielding should be limited to the uh, steel cross sections as was done before. Uh, and reinforcing rebars in the joint region should be actually detailed according to uh, Annex I uh, for slabs. And uh, this Annex has been refined uh, with the primary uh, mechanisms acting on the slab, including mechanism one that you see here that relates to direct bearing on the column as well as mechanism two here that relates to strut and tie. But one thing that has changed here is that uh, with regards to mechanism two, now there have been expressions here uh, where the, um, uh, uh, that allow for um, uh, strut and tie mechanisms of different angles theta here uh, that, uh, than 45 degrees, uh, which was essentially the value that was used in the current code. And uh, in certain cases, this uh, was problematic uh, in terms of uh, flexibility uh, uh, between exterior and interior frames. Uh, now, section 12.8.8 uh, 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 relates to verification of composite joints in uh, dissipative zone, zones again. Uh, this relates to one of the questions that we've heard before. Uh, essentially, uh, here there has been a significant enhancement by developing Annex G uh, that includes uh, a composite joints. And uh, one of them uh, essentially is joints between steel and RC uh, concrete columns uh, that are covered in detail in G5. And uh, this uh, section uh, considers design provisions uh, with a wide uh, face uh, bedding plates, as well as joints with extended uh, face uh, bedding plates. And uh, also uh, the uh, annex uh, and this section G5 uh, demonstrates what would be the joint forces that the joint should be designed, uh, as well as provides uh, expressions where the joint failure modes, including web panels here, as well as vertical bearing are explicitly um, uh, quantified with uh, equations uh, that essentially allow uh, to uh, design the joint explicitly. Moreover, with regard to the uh, concrete column that you see here, uh, there are explicit details on how to uh, uh, design and detail the concrete column with horizontal and vertical reinforcing details, such as those seen here, including the zone right above the uh, steel column uh, where uh, crossing could occur because of the deformation of the beam. Uh, this is, I think, an important addition, considering that uh, these type of uh, connections do not require welding. And uh, in uh, countries where uh, uh, the use of concrete columns uh, is actually, uh, or the use of concrete generally is uh, quite popular, uh, 
uh, steel beams could be used to accelerate the construction of the floor system. Uh, and uh, with the additional rules here, uh, designer has flexibility on what to do with the actual concrete column. Uh, moreover, the uh, Annex J now covers uh, uh, composite joints uh, with diaphragm plates. Uh, this is according to uh, G6. And uh, these are categorized as internal, external, and through diaphragm plates that you see here in the last figure. Though, note that in all cases, when using diaphragm plates, joints are designed as full strength with all plastic deformations uh, localized in the composite steel beam. And uh, moreover, uh, the annex provides details, uh, for instance, uh, that, that ease uh, the construction. For instance, here in internal and through joints, you see that there are uh, 25 millimeter holes that essentially facilitate uh, concrete pouring. Uh, now, specifically to uh, section 12.9 and composite moment resistant frames, uh, generally these follow the uh, design provisions in 11.9 that Professor Landolfo uh, uh, touched in, the, in his presentation. I would like to just uh, provide uh, one particular uh, detail that is actually quite important. This relates to provisions on columns in DC3. So for uh, H-I shape or HSS columns, there have been limits now that have been incorporated on the gravity induced uh, axial load ratio. So the, uh, uh, this ratio should be limited to 30% uh, to minimize uh, uh, column axial shortening that has been evident in uh, both in uh, tests, but also in the field if you, if you Follow some of the uh, past earthquakes. And similarly, if you are looking into uh, encased, partially encased or filled composite columns, because now you have the beneficial actual action of concrete, uh, the uh, corresponding axial load limit uh, is actually 75% of the uh, plastic resistance of the composite member as calculated according to uh, Eurocode 4. And uh, here, what's important is again, to limit the axial load uh, to excessive values so that uh, uh, fracture uh, localized in the corners of these members, uh, followed by concrete crushing inside these uh, tubes uh, can be uh, prevented. Along the same lines, when it comes to uh, composite walls in uh, DC2 and DC3, uh, the normalized design axial load should be limited to uh, 40 and 35% of the composite axial resistance of the wall for DC2 and DC3 uh, respectively. And uh, here uh, N0 essentially is the uh, ratio between the steel and the concrete portion in the uh, uh, actual uh, cross section of the uh, seismic wall. And here you see a snapshot uh, of the uh, uh, new sketches that are actually provided in the uh, code. Now, uh, as Professor Landolfo uh, pointed out, there is a new Annex H on column-based joints for seismic applications. And uh, uh, this is uh, particularly important because it provides uh, details for exposed column-based connections with various eccentricities uh, that you see here including other important details that control the behavior of uh, exposed column-based connections, such as uh, leveling nuts that are used at the grout interface, as well as uh, the uh, utilization of shear keys to essentially control uh, slip due to shear. Uh, what is actually interesting also is that in section H5, uh, there are uh, also new provisions on how to design and detail embedded column-based connections, uh, that this could be important, for instance, if you are dealing with uh, mid or high-rise systems uh, where exposed column-based connections could start becoming quite uh, expensive, primarily because of the uh, well details and the thicknesses of the column-based connections that uh, somebody may need to accommodate the uh, interaction of axial load and bending. 
so I am in the I, I am at about 24 minutes or so. So I think I'm doing okay with time. So what I've decided to do also is I've decided to give you a small flavor on some uh, design examples that you know we've done some work. And in particular, what's interesting here is to to contrast DC2 with DCM uh, from the uh, new and current code. So for these comparisons, I will use a prototype six-story uh, building that is comprised of three bay frames in one direction and braced frames in the other direction. The site class that has been selected is D with a peak ground acceleration of 0.22 at Z. And uh, we've done comparative designs in uh, different sites across Europe including uh, Caterini from Greece, Brelia from Romania, Rimini in Italy, and Sion in uh, Switzerland. So what's interesting about these locations is that they have the same exact design spectrum, more or less, as well as snow and wind conditions, but they have a different uh, uh, seismic hazard curve. So essentially the uh, frequency of events is not the same for different spectral accelerations uh, that you may be interested uh, here. Uh, we've done two different designs on composite steel beams with uh, full composite action, as well as 80% uh, of composite action. And uh, in all cases, we use the Q factor of three uh, to basically understand a little bit what's happening with DC2 when we don't apply capacity design at the joints, but we do explicitly uh, member checks as we saw, as we saw earlier and DCM, which is the current version. So the plan view uh, that you see here, uh, as we said, you know, is comprised of moment frames in one direction, frames frames in the other direction. This is an idealized plan. And for sure, if you explore this this way, I think now uh, using the code is important with different configurations. Obviously, uh, we will see a lot of interesting uh, findings. Uh, but with this, uh, plan view here, uh, if you want to get an idea, uh, for instance, one thing that you will see is that the usually the first mode periods of uh, designs according to the uh, new code, which is the column here on the right, would generally be a bit larger compared to uh, what you would typically get in DCMs. Uh, for instance, if you do, uh, 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 if you use a degree of composite action of 100%, uh, DCM would give you about 1.6 seconds, whereas the uh, new provisions uh, would be in the range of two seconds. And the reason is that now we're not doing the uh, drift limit uh, verification for uh, serviceability, but we basically only uh, check drift limits at the significant damage limit state. And naturally that would make the uh, structures a bit more flexible because as we said, moment frames generally above four stories would be drift controlled. Uh, another thing that is of interest here, if you uh, contrast the steel weight, uh, so on the left, you have the DCM design, on the right, you have the new design according to a DC2. And uh, generally the new design would be about 20% lighter in this case, primarily because columns are going to be a bit lighter Indicatively, in the first story, we have an HCB of 340 in the DC2, whereas in the DCM, we have an HCB of 550. And this is because in DC2, we said that now we're not doing capacity design in the joints. Uh, moreover, you will see that beams generally are lighter. Uh, so the DC2 would lead to an IP of 360, whereas the DCM an IP of 400. And this is related also to the ductility requirements that I discussed uh, in uh, in uh, the new uh, provisions. Uh, now, we've analyzed these systems, uh, particularly to ensure that we don't get the soft story uh, mechanisms because in DC2, now we're not doing capacity design. And uh, here you see uh, that now the overstrength values that we get if you conduct a, a conventional pushover analysis with the rules that are now provided in uh, uh, part one one, uh, you see that overstrength values in this case would range in the range of, let's say, two to three, as we see here, whereas uh, in DCM, uh, generally the overstrength values would be much larger, 
primarily because of the uh, drift control uh, that was limiting the design uh, in the past. Moreover, if you look at the performance of the buildings uh, at different uh, roof drift uh, ratios or at different, let's say, drift angles, uh, you see that uh, the uh, deformation pattern uh, is uh, more or less uniform in DC2. So that shows that the system, although capacity design hasn't been used at the joint level, uh, if you worry about significant damage limit state or even uh, event that will take the structure to a larger drift, generally uh, there are no uh, there is no development of a soft story uh, mechanism, uh, which is actually quite nice to see. Uh, there have been studies also where the actual uh, ground motion uh, content has been uh, considered for the design locations I showed, uh, and here you see a snapshot on uh, ground motion selection. Uh, that we've done uh, based on local seismicity. Uh, so uh, for a set of 40 ground motions, not just one, if again you contrast uh, what would be the actual deformation um, uh, or interstory drift angles expected uh, for a DC2 design here on the right, you see that on average, uh, the uh, performance of the building would uh, actually be uh, well below the new drift limit at SD. And also uh, the um, uh, deformation along the building height uh, would not localize at any story, despite the fact that capacity design hasn't been uh, considered. Uh, one thing to note though, is that the, there's a slight increase in the variability of the response uh, due to the ground motion content compared to a DCM uh, design, but uh, this variability is not uh, uh, very large. So uh, I believe I'm around 30 minutes, so I will stop it here. I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitrios, for his uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I have, I have a question regarding uh, the um, one of the slides that uh, you have seen, that you have shown regarding the effective width um, yes. that uh, it was calculated if you go at the beginning, maybe, of your presentation. Yes, so you're talking about this one or next one? This one, yes, this one, yes, yes. This one, uh, okay. So you are, you are, you are, you are, you are showing then a, um, a result that seems an experimental result, right, with respect to then the the provision by the, by the code, right? Am yes. I correct? So, yeah, both. Yes. Yeah, both are, both are experimental. Uh, so both are experimental results where the effective width has yeah. been explicitly uh, measured, and uh, essentially what the results show uh, is that the recommended value that you have in the code essentially um, matches what the effective width would be uh, when the moment frame would. Uh, essentially a deform uh, at uh, about 2% drift, which is the limit for significant damage limit state. Yes, but is, is this a single set of experimentations or do you have so the, something? Yes, yes, so this, uh, yes, so, yes, so this uh, particular uh, result here is uh, obviously one experiment that you see, but we've collected about 120, if I recall correctly, experiments uh, from the literature where we've seen that the uh, the um, value that uh, the values that you see more or less reflect the same uh, findings yeah, okay correct thank you thank you we have a we have a question by Kagatai Tahal Istanbul Technical University is the system that contains concrete columns and steel girders or steel truss structural system allowed does it ensure ductility conditions in new version? And then another question is that uh, by the same uh, uh, attendee, is there a study that observes 
dumping coefficient and Q values of a composite mega columns at the tall buildings. Uh, okay, so for the regarding the first question, the if I understand correctly, the question uh, the system that you see here, which is uh, composite beams uh, with uh, with uh, concrete columns, is actually allowed. I think there were some provisions in the current version of the code, but what you will have now is much more detailed, uh, uh, including structural, uh, including details on the reinforcement for the concrete column. The, the um, uh, question about ductility, the, if you follow the details, the ductility requirements are ensured because the provisions that you see here are based on extensive uh, um, work uh, that relates to more than 500 experiments on uh, 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 this type of systems that were originally developed uh, in Japan, but then you know, later on were advanced in uh, US and Europe. Uh, so the ductility requirements should be uh, no problem. So I, I, I maybe I didn't catch the last question that you had. Yes, I can repeat it for you uh, by the same uh, uh, the same researcher is Kagatita Agro from Istanbul Technical University, and the question is the following. Is there a study that observed dumping coefficient and Q values for composite mega columns at tall buildings? So uh, is referring yes, to yes, yes, yes. mega columns, tall buildings? Yes. Yes. So uh, uh, I, I yes, I I can answer. Yes. So uh, if let's say for structures up to about twenty stories, uh, where the use of uh, field tubes has been used. There have been uh, studies that quantify the performance of these buildings uh, from the onset of damage all the way to collapse. And uh, the, the behavior of these buildings with the proposed Q factors that, that uh, you have here is, uh, uh, let's say, is at least the same with conventional steel buildings. If you look at local member uh, deformations, columns, for instance, uh, generally the filled tubes would perform a little better compared to uh, conventional uh, steel uh, structural members, primarily because uh, axial shortening, which is uh, an important failure mode that controls uh, damage of columns, is actually prohibited at uh, uh, typical deformation levels to expect. Now on mega columns, uh, there have been studies, uh, uh, either like scaled specimens or uh, or um, uh, uh, on, more on the uh, simulation side, uh, where uh, where the benchmarking of uh, of their behavior is uh, let's say um, has been done, but uh, I'm not aware of. Um, let's say besides projects that with buildings that have been actually built, I'm not aware of uh, actual results on mega columns uh, on super tall buildings. Okay, thank you very much Dimitrios for also for this, for this very interesting presentation and uh, also for the exhaustive uh, answers to the questions. And we can uh, go directly to the next presentation.